today will speak about the way or path of of reaching or getting to atamayata in particular <clears throat> we'll, we'll speak particularly about this this path we mentioned previously that anapanasati is the complete system of practice which is the most efficient way of of realizing atamayata in the word anapanasati the most important word is sati the last word sati mindfulness is the key the crucial element in anapanasati however of all the ways of training and using mindfulness training mindfulness on the breathing in and out is the <clears throat> most beneficial approach is the best way when one practices anapanasati completely and correctly according to the the way it is taught in the the pali scriptures then one has a way of practice that is that is complete and perfect <coughs> in that there is sila or ethics proper conduct in speech there's samati the calming and stabilizing of the mind and there is panya intuitive wisdom in anapanasati when practiced as taught by the buddha there will be these three three elements the three the three trainings of the path will be there together and com- complete there are many ways of of practicing there are other ways of practicing anapanasati but if these other ways will not be complete in sila samati and panya the yogis in in india are also practicing anapanasati in many forms they call it pranayama pranayama which means controlling the breath controlling the breath and this is done in all kinds of different ways according to the the way each of these yogis has has learned prana <coughs> means breath but it can just as well mean life because in those in the old days people took that breath was life so prana means both breath life and is even seen as the life force this understanding of pranayama goes back very very far before there was anything that we could properly call religion in back the the people who were still living in the forests caves and jungles started to notice the the wonder and excellence of the breath how how marvelous and powerful the breath could be this was something that occurred naturally this was taught to them by nature and in a natural way they they discovered pranayama what they discovered was that when the breath is is long with long healthy breaths a lot of one feels really comfortable and at ease there's a great feeling of health and strength <clears throat> when one breathes in long easy breaths 
a lot of oxygen is brought in and so the body is very comfortable the body is able to rest and relax and also breathing in this way helps to is this way of breathing controls and eliminates any bad or evil moods there are a lot of harmful mind states such as anger fear and so on and this long deep healthy breathing can just sweep all of those ugly mind states out and then the mind will be calm and clear and peaceful as well this is what this was discovered in a very natural way or if if there was a cut and blood was flowing with very long relaxed deep breaths the blood flow would <clears throat> would slow down and could even be stopped by the influence of the breathing this is an example of how the breathing can control the body of the the powerful influence of the breath when it's used properly to to control the body the breathing has various physical effects on the body as we've mentioned including it it lowers the blood pressure the long deep breathing can lower the blood blood pressure there are also mental effects and influences as well the long deep breathing is able to to calm away sweep away any harmful emotions and moods which which assail the mind and so in this way anapanasati was a science way before anybody really knew of the word science the very ancient science naturally discovered by our our primitive ancestors this we should understand mindfulness with breathing in this aspect as a as a starting place then in the buddha's time 2500 years ago it seems that the knowledge and practice of anapanasati had spread all over india because even at the age of 7 the the young prince sitata who later left home and became the buddha as a young prince the prince sitata was practicing anapanasati and was quite quite successful in the early stages of it at at the age of 7 but in those days the way of practice was incomplete the it hadn't been developed to its completion to its fine full potential but then the buddha was exploring anapanasati and through his explorations investigations and discoveries developed it further and further until until awakening on the buddha said that he awakened achieved complete liberation while practicing anapanasati he had been practicing it and taking it further and further beyond what anyone else had done with it until taking it all the way to perfect liberation and then in this way completed the system of practice and realized <coughs> its fullest potential the buddha himself said that when practicing this to the point that that i dwelled only in anapanasati then then there was the the per, the final awakening and so because of this the buddha recommended and taught this system specifically the buddha 
only taught one system of meditation. And this is called, this is the system of Anapanasati. Now sometimes he didn't use this name. Sometimes he spoke of it in terms of the Satipatthana, the foundations of mindfulness. But he was teaching the same system of meditation, and it's the system of Anapanasati that he practiced himself. And this is what he taught and encouraged the monks to do. Nowadays there are dozens of kinds of meditation, but the Buddha himself taught only only one. And we we maintain that this is the practice called Anapanasati. Then a thousand years after the Buddha, <clears throat> there was a, a Brahmin man who, who became a Buddhist and wrote a big fat book called the Visuddhimagga, The Path of Purity. This, this man, Buddha Gosa Acharya, collected a lot of information on meditation. And in this book he recorded 40 kinds of meditation. And so ever since, Buddhists have, have been going around talking about the 40 kinds of meditation. And so, and then after that, more and more techniques and methods and systems of meditation have been invented so that now there's all kinds of them all over the place. None of these newly invented systems, however, are, are better than Anapanasati. None of them achieve better results. So one ought to be interested in the original system, the, the system used and practiced by the Buddha himself. <clears throat> because it's a system that goes back way before the Buddha, discovered by our ancient ancestors, and then it is developed and evolved through the experience of many, many people until it was perfected through the Buddha's experience. So this is the an ancient and venerable system of practice, one that we ought to be interested in. But nowadays you hear about Theravadin meditation, Mahayana meditation, Zen meditation, Tibetan meditation, all kinds of meditations, meditations all over, and doing all kinds of different things. Please note, however, that Anapanasati is a way of meditation is a complete system that is quiet, simple, and peaceful. In Anapanasati, for example, one doesn't have to make any noise. One can do it while sitting very quietly. One doesn't have to stand and stretch and move the body around in various postures and movements. One can sit peacefully and do it. It's very simple. One doesn't have to bring in any complicated theories or any visualizations or any of that. It's a very quiet, calm, simple system of meditation. One doesn't have to also carry around any special furniture or special devices in, able to, in order to meditate. The details about practicing Anapanasati can be found in a manual that has already been printed. So if you're interested, you can find that book and study it yourselves. What we'd like to discuss today is how Anapanasati leads to the realization of the knowledge which we call, which is called atamayata. In anapanasati, there are four areas of study, four <coughs> groups of lessons for us to investigate. 
the first group or area is about the body in specifically preparing the body and the nervous system so that they're calm and quiet and provide a fitting foundation for higher levels of study and practice. The, if you study the meaning of the first area re regarding the body, you'll see that it prepares the body so that one is able to investigate things on a higher and more profound level. The second area helps us to know how the mind relates to the body, how the body and mind are interrelated, and then to lessen the and then to lessen the ability, lessen the of that relationship, that association to concoct the mind. The third area <coughs> deals with the mind itself directly. The third area is about understanding the mind in its various manifestations and then mastering that mind. Mastering by making it, it by delighting it, forcing the mind to be glad and delighted by stabilizing the mind, collecting it and concentrating it, and then li liberating it, freeing it. The third area is all about mastering the mind so that one is out from under the mind's control and power. <clears throat> then when the body and mind has been prepared through these first three groups of lessons, then one comes to the fourth group. And this is where the mind starts to look into the reality of things. Mm -hmm. And this is where there arise the, first of all, anicetta, the fact of impermanence. So one, <clears throat> one studies, contemplates the fact of impermanence. And then you don't have to worry if this is done correctly, it will, it will lead to all the other tas, all of the nine tas from impermanence, to unsatisfactoriness, selflessness, naturalness, the natural law, conditionality, voidness, thusness, and finally, unconcoctability, atamayata. In the discourse where the Buddha discussed this, or in the discourses where this is discussed, only anicetta is mentioned. But if anicetta is seen thoroughly and correctly, it will lead to seeing all the rest of the nine tas. <clears throat> you, the first three areas of, of training are essentially the development of samati, developing the mind's strength, clarity, and power. Or we can say samatha, the development of tranquility. So the first three groups of lessons develop samadhi. And within that, there is also sila. There is ethics and morality. But then the fourth area is where vipassana specifically is essentially and purely vipassana, seeing clearly into the nature of things. Or we can say this is the, the part of the practice that is exclusively panya, about intuitive wisdom. To just go and see things in their true nature, doesn't, it just doesn't happen. First, the body and mind have to be calmed and prepared. The mind must be stabilized, cleared, and focused. If this is done properly with the first areas of practice, then, then it's possible to come to see anicetta quite, quite easily. <clears throat> it's seen all over in all its aspects, in all meanings, 
and sig significations of of the fact of anicca. The word ta 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 or in Thai ta <coughs> in Pali merely means state of being, the state of being. But coincidentally, this word in Thai, same sounding spelling, means I, the thing we see with, E-Y-E. So in Thai, da, da, da means I or eyes. And so in Pali, the nine Tas are the nine states of being, but in, in Thai, they're the nine eyes. And this is nine ways of seeing reality, nine ways of seeing the truth, or nine, we can say the nine insights, the nine vipassana. The mind is prepared correctly, then these nine eyes arise and enable one to see things as they really are, which is the meaning of vipassana. When anicca, the fact of impermanence, is seen thoroughly, then there is all nine of these tas. When all nine eyes arise, then there is what we call viraka. There's the fading away of ignorance. Through the, when all these nine eyes are there, then ignorance fades away and the defilements fade away. Attachments, attachment fades away and dukkha fades away. Viraka means fading away. So there is this fading away of, of dukkha and all the things associated with dukkha, all the causes of dukkha. It's just like the dye used to, to dye cloth, the color used to dye cloth. If you keep pouring water into this color, this dye, then it, it becomes lighter and lighter and lighter. It fades and fades. And so, this is what happens once the nine eyes arise. This fading away of dukkha and the causes of dukkha is the, the activity of atamayata working. All these nine eyes culminating in atamayata. And then the, act, the activity of them working is this fading away. As this fading, once there is this fading away, then there is a quenching. There's the quenching of dukkha. Dukkha is quenched. And then there's the quenching of defilements. And there is the quenching of attachment, which is the cause of defilements in dukkha. And there's the quenching of ignorance, which is the ultimate cause of all dukkha. So this, this is the result of the activity of a tamayata. The, the result, the fruit of a tamayata's working is this quenching of dukkha, of attachment, of ignorance. This quenching is called nirota, nirota, which means quenching, extinguishing, to put out all these fires so that there is coolness. And this nirota is a synonym for nibbana. Nibbana means coolness. Nirota is the quenching. Or, and when things are fully quenched, they are cool. Not cold, but cool. The fourth lesson <coughs> in this last area of study the study of Dhamma is called Bhati Nitsaka. And this is where one has finished all the duties, all the things that need to be done have been completed. 
one all attachment has ended all suffering has been quenched there is no more ignorance all positive and negative has has disappeared having been illusions in the first place and then there is nothing to do except acknowledge that none of these things are mine or are me or ever were you can compare this to in vatinitsa kamins tossing away just tossing everything away in acknowledgement that it's not me it's not mine this can be compared to the fact that previously in our ignorance we've we've been possessing everything we've been stealing these bodies these minds these thoughts we've been laying claim to everything as i and mine which is basically an act of theft but through the fading away of ignorance we realize the stupidity of possessing these these bodies and minds and everything else and then just toss it all back toss it all back to nature the the rightful owner this is called atinitsata which is the fourth lesson and the final lesson of anapanasati an easy way to remember this is that we are thieves we are our thieves and have been thieves all our life we're, we're constantly stealing things taking them to be i or mine and because of this constant thieving there also must be punishment and the punishment is dukkha dukkha i'm not talking about physical dukkha but real dukkha with this punishment of dukkha we finally start to learn that something's wrong and through the using anapanasati to delve deeper and deeper into the situation and the problems leads to atamayata and then this cuts through all the the attachments and ignorance until one realizes oh i I've, i've gone and been a thief all my life foolishly stealing all these things from their rightful owner now let's throw them all back and so we throw everything back to nature throwing back is a better word <clears throat> is a minute ago i said throwing away which is actually another word wotsaka bati nitsaka means throwing back we don't just toss things away but we throw it back acknowledging that all of these things belong to nature to dhamma we've now taken an overview of the system of practice called anapanasati and it briefly shown how it leads to the full understanding and realization of atamayata of unconcoctability <clears throat> this is one structure one way of explaining how how this occurs there's a different way of talking about it and this is what we'll go into next we'd like to talk about the ariya atankika ma the noble eight factored path the noble eightfold path or the noble eight factored path is something that has been discussed in many places and so you can read about it in books both both by us and other places it's not very difficult the noble eightfold path is one path or way of life but to understand it more fully it's explained in terms of its eight factors right understanding right aspiration right speech right action right livelihood right effort right mindfulness and right samadhi right concentration these eight factors cannot be separated in fact it's it's one path because it's just one life when one maintains life lives life 
according to this Noble Eightfold Path, then there will be a tamayata all the time. The effect of following the Noble Eightfold Path, not in the future, but right now, the effect right now is a tamayata, whenever the, the path is full and perfect. The essence of this is that it is correct and right. For to be the Noble Eightfold Path, there must be correctness and rightness. This is very important. Often people forget about the correctness part, and so they never have the path. They never understand what is meant by the path. So first of all, there must be right view, right understanding, or samaditi. Samaditi is the, the way of looking at things, the way of understanding things, all our beliefs and uh, views, as well as <clears throat> our ideals. All of these are correct. All these understandings are correct. Then this leads to right aspiration. Our aims, our goals, our needs are all correct. And then following this there is right speech. Speech is always correct. Right action and right livelihood, the way of the way we maintain life, the way we go about getting the physical, the material and mental necessities of life. This is done correctly. Then there's right effort, doing one's best, putting full energy into everything one does, but doing so correctly. And then right mindfulness, mindful of the right things in the right way. This must be correct. And then finally, right samadhi, right concentration where the mind is stabilized, collected, and focused in the right way, correctly. If all of these are correct, then they fit together into one correct whole. And that's what we call the Noble Eightfold Path. This is what leads to atamayata. When all of these eight factors are correct, then you, and then they come together in a whole, it's incredibly powerful. You don't just have eight separate things kind of working on their own, but when they, the energy of all eight of these factors come together, you've got eight times the power and the strength. When these, when it, all the factors are an integrated whole, very powerful whole, then it's called in, it's given another name in the Pali. There are places where it's called Ariyamati with seven attendants, seven attendants or supporters. The last factor is Samati, which is often translated concentration. <clears throat> but the refined levels of concentration always have equanimity at their heart. The, the mind that is completely balanced in a, a clear equili equilibrium. So we could call it excellent right equilibrium with seven attendments, tendons. The word adiya means excellent, superb, noble. And so the, the path is also called excellent right equanimity with seven attendants, or you could call it noble right concentration with seven supporters. And please, please don't go and think that there are eight paths. To think that there are eight paths or many paths is to completely misunderstand. There's only one path. So please don't go and confuse the words eightfold or eight-factored 
and think there are eight paths. There's only, there's only one path. Please don't fall into the, the confusion of many people, even in Thailand, who've been Buddhists for hundreds of years, and they still misunderstand this. There's only one path. If you've got eight paths, you'll never know which one to choose, and you'll never get anywhere. So it's understand it as one path which has eight, eight components, or you could say that has eight, eight qualities. This single path has these eight qualities to it. To an easy way to, to see it is to talk about it in more physical terms. Someone's going on a journey. We need, we need a correct map of where we are and where we're going. We need the right kind of aim, desire to travel. We need to have, we need to have food and all the physical material supports needed for that journey. There needs to be restraint and safety in one's speech and conduct. There always has to be right effort to, to get anywhere, to travel. There must always be, we always have to put effort into it, but it has to be the right kind of effort. There must be awareness of where one is, where one's going, and awareness, mindfulness of anything that that meets us along the way. And then there must always be the, the focus. The mind must be stable and focused on, on its destination. So all of these, so it's one path that has these eight qualifications or qualities to it. Miss, if any of these qualities are missing, the path will, will not lead to the correct goal. When the eight qualities are complete and full, and the path is, is, is whole, then there arises a ninth factor. Once the eight factors are full and complete, there arises the ninth factor, which is called samayana, or right knowledge. Except, be careful, it's knowledge for most of us has a very petty and trivial meaning. But here, jnana means knowledge that is correct, complete, knowing what must be known, what needs to be known. So it's, it's, it's complete knowledge or full knowledge, perfect knowledge. This is the result of, of the path becoming whole. The ninth factor is this right insight knowledge. This word knowledge here is basically a synonym for panya, intuitive wisdom, <coughs> or vipassana, insight. So it's this, this insight knowledge, this thorough insight knowledge is what results as the ninth factor. And in this, there is a tammayata. This itself is a tammayata. And then the result of this, <coughs> of a tammayata, is the tenth, the tenth factor, which is called sama vimuti, vimuti or vimuti with a v, which means right emancipation or even right salvation. When there is a tamayata. It cuts through everything that is trapping, that is tying up the mind, or we could say life. And then, then the mind is emancipated from all its bonds, from all bondage, all prisons, from all dukkha. This is the result of, of the realization of a tamayata. <clears throat> the eight factors of the noble path are the causes, are the set of causes which lead to the two, two results of 
right insight knowledge and right emancipation. The first eight factors are just the causes. They're not, they're not everything. They're just the causes. Then there are these two results of sama vimuti and sama, or sama jnana and sama vimuti. All ten taken together can be said to be Buddhism in its entirety. All of Buddhas, to talk about all of Buddhism, there must be all ten of these. Just the first eight isn't enough. Buddhism, to be whole, encompasses the last two factors. Or, all together these ten are normally called the samatha, or the ten samatha, the ten states of being correct. There's this da 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 word again. And sama means correct, right. So the ten states of rightness or correctness. This is this is the heart and essence and whole entirety of Buddhism in these ten factors. It's one thing with ten factors, ten qualities. Most of you have probably never heard of these, the samatas, the ten samatha before. It's never written about in, in most of the books. You've all had a chance to hear about the Noble Eightfold Path, but you haven't heard the full story until you understand the samatha, the ten samatha. The eight factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. These are the factors to be practiced. This is what is to be practiced. But when it's practiced until complete, there arises the, the second two factors. The eight, these two, the eight causes and the two results together. This is the, the whole story. This is what is complete. The Buddha once, the Buddha said that anyone who has the Buddha as a good friend, anyone who takes the Buddha as their best friend, will escape from all the problems associated with birth, aging, illness, and death. Which means one, one who takes the Buddha as their best friend as their good friend, their best friend, will not have any more dukkha in life. Dukkha happens in life, in the natural processes of birth, aging, illness, and death. With the Buddha as our best friend, we escape from all the dukkha associated with life. Notice, notice that he used the word good friend or Kalayana Mita. Mita means friend. Kalayana means good, beautiful, good, beautiful, splendid, noble. So the Buddha used the word good friend. This is very important, the emphasis on, on a friend. He didn't use the word teacher, guru, master, boss or any of, or owner, or priest, or any of these words. He just used the word good friend. And the meaning here is very, very special. If one takes the Buddha not as one's master or teacher, but as one's good friend, then one escapes from birth, aging, illness, and death. These things are no longer any problems. For us, there's no dukkha in these natural processes of life. But look around us nowadays. We're hardly ever good friends anymore. The relationship is hardly ever one of being a good friend like the Buddha recommended. Instead, there are teachers, there are masters, there are bosses, people giving orders and all kinds of things. 
please give a lot of consideration to the fact that the Buddha used, referred to himself not as a teacher or master, but as a good friend. And that if we take the Buddha as this good friend, we, we escape from all the problems of birth, aging, illness, and death. The most one could say would, would be that the Buddha is the leader, the one who walks first and then shows us the way. But in no way is, there a, is the Buddha a dictator or an authority telling us what to do, trying to force us into anything. Buddha just shows the way for those who want to, to walk. And the Buddha said when one has, has him as their good friend, then one has the ten samatha. <clears throat> if one really has the Buddha as your best friend, then all ten samatha are there, all ten complete and full. There's both atamayata and the fruits of atamayata and things and it's all finished. The story or it is over. Whether by living with anapanasati, by using anapanasati as our way of living, or, or by taking the noble eightfold path, the excellent eight-factored path as our, our way of living. Either way, then we have, we have the best friends that one can find the four the four friends of sati mindfulness panya intuitive wisdom sampachanya implied insight applied insight and samati the the concentrated stabilized equanimous mind when all four of these we have all four of these friends by living correctly, then there are no problems. We, we are safe, safe from all dangers, both physical and mental. If we would ha like some, some holy water that cleanses away our sins, like they, have, like they talk about in Christianity and in Hinduism, if we would like to have this, the Buddha said that you can't. The, the best water for washing and cleansing away sins is the ten samatha. The Buddha, or suppose we have eaten something, something poisonous, something very harmful, and it's it's in our stomach and intestines. The Buddha said that if we would need a purgative to clean it out or something to make us vomit it up. The Buddha said that the ten samatha are, are this purgative that, that flushes out everything foul, poisonous and harmful. It's a vomitory, a, a medicine that makes us vomit up everything which is harmful, dangerous, dirty. And so this is, these are some metaphors the Buddha used for the, the ten states of rightness. They're, they're the best friend one can have. They're the water that washes away all sins. They're the purgative that flushes out everything foul and dangerous. They're the vomitory that makes us throw up all the poison in, in us. Because there is a tamayata in these ten samatha, only because there is a tamayata in these ten, are, is it able to, are they able to flush out all the poison, throw up all the garbage, and wash away 
all the sins only because of atamayata in those ten states of rightness. We've been looking at the results of atamayata. If one understands the results and effects of atamayata, then you will understand atamayata itself. So we've been looking at these results in order that you will better better know what atamayata is. Whether Theravada Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, any, no matter what form or version of Buddhism it is, if something is truly Buddhism, it, it teaches that all suffering arises from attachment to the five khandhas. The five khandhas are the five fundamental functions of human life, both the physical and mental processes that together make up human life. If we grasp at these as I and mine, then suffering arises immediately. To free life from suffering, one must cut these attachments to the five khandhas. It doesn't mean killing oneself or anything. It means just stopping the foolishness of attaching to things as I and mine. This is taught in all schools of Buddhism. So in fact, we don't need all the different schools of Buddhism. There's just one Buddhism, this essence of Buddhism that teaches all suffering comes from attaching to the five khandhas. Stop that attaching and there's no suffering. If anything doesn't teach this, then it's not Buddhism. But anything, no matter what's going on on the surface, if this is the core teaching, then this, is, this itself is the essence of Buddhism. And in that, you can see once again, atamayata is what allows us to cut off those attachments to the five khandhas so that life is free, so that there's no suffering anymore. If there's no atamayata, then there's no Buddhism. There, if something, if there's no atamayata in something, then that thing isn't Buddhism. Because then there's nothing to cut through the attachments and free one from dukkha. There's no Buddhism in it, and it isn't Buddhism without atamayata. There's no perfect awakening and there would be no Buddha. There's no Buddha without atamayata. There's no ultramundane, there's no transcendence of the world without atamayata. Now we'd like to look at the Buddha himself. If there was, if there was no atamayata, the the prince Sitata never would have left home to search for the way out from suffering. Or once having left home in search of truth in the way out of dukkha. Without a tamayata, the prince, now an ascetic, would, would have just gotten stuck at the highest level of knowledge available at that time. He wouldn't have been able to go beyond it. The last teacher that the Buddha stayed with was teaching a very deep and subtle state of concentration called Newa Sanyana Sanyatana, which means the, the experience which is neither experience 
nor non-experience. This is the, the experience is, that is neither perception nor non-perception is another way of translating it, which we could call the utmost absorption, where the mind is so absorbed into itself. You can't say that the mind is experiencing anything, but you can't say that it's not experiencing. This was the, the highest mystical state taught in the Buddha's, when the, before the Buddha appeared in the world. And the prince would have just got stuck there if there wasn't a tamayata. But because of a tamayata, the prince saw that this was not the end of suffering. This was not the end of dukkha, it was just a very refined state that was impermanent and not worth relying upon. So the Buddha said atamayata and went beyond that until finding the true and total end of dukkha. Atamayata is used to progress from step to step to step. At every stage we tend to get stuck and don't we, we get comfortable and feel secure and don't want to go any further. It's a dhammayata that allows us to get unstuck so we can proceed to the next level and stage. If a dhammayata keeps releasing us from the current stage, then we can go further and further until we are beyond all stages when we, when we have transcended all levels and all conditions. Any stage or level is just a condition and there's dukkha in that condition. But to transcend all those levels we need a tamayata to keep, keep letting us free. Everything has what we call its atsada, atsada, the which means an attr the attractiveness. It's the charm. Everything has a charm, something that pulls and attracts us. And so first we get stuck in in sexuality, in sensuousness, in sexuality. It has an attractiveness, a deliciousness and we get stuck in that. If the mind can go to a higher level, if there's enough atamayata to abandon, to let go of this sensuality and sexuality and move to a higher level, then the mind will get stuck in, in pure forms, material things which where one's attracted to just the materiality in itself, not the sensual pleasures that they can bring. And then one gets stuck in, in the pure forms. Then atamayata allows us to let go, releases us from the attractiveness of these pure forms. And then one gets stuck in the formless, things that are beyond all form and materiality. But even these, these formless things, things like beauty, truth, justice, love, all these, these beautiful ideas, all these formless concepts, even these are impermanent, and our dukkha. And so this, it's just, it's, it eventually is too much for the mind. It's still concocting suffering. And so there is a tamayata that releases the mind from the attractiveness of these formless things. And then the mind goes beyond all, all conditions. Sen the sensual, the pure form and the formless, these are all just conditions. They're just all 
states for ego to arise. And Adamayada releases the mind from all of that. So Adamayada releases the mind so that it can rise above all these conditions, be free of all these conditions, and transcend the entire universe to be above and no longer trapped within the universe. This in Pali is called that state of being beyond all conditions is called nirota. It's the quenching of all dukkha, the quenching of all states and conditions. This is another name for nibbana, perfect coolness. This quenching or coolness of nibbana has doesn't have any attractiveness. It doesn't have any condition in any way whatsoever. So by now we've looked at the the Dhamma benefits, the spiritual benefits of Atamayata from quite a number of angles. Now it's it would be interesting to take some time to look at some of the worldly benefits of Atamayata, ways that Atamayata can help us in just the ordinary worldly business of our lives. Any woman who has Atamayata can't be tricked by any man. No man will be able to make you fall in love. No man will be able to lure you. And then any man who has a tamayata, there won't be any woman anywhere who can lure you into love and trap you. So you don't turn into anyone's bait. So this is a very worldly benefit of a tamayata. One won't be the victim of all the advertising and deception that's filling up the world. There's no way that one can will be a victim of any of any of that trickery and deception. One won't be a victim of any political uh, any politics, politician or political system. No one can hypnotize you. No one can can implant thoughts and ideas in your mind. You won't you won't get infatuated with material material progress. Dhammayata will lessen the amount of insane people and will lessen the amount of suicides. It will le- lessen crime and war. Dhammayata will lessen, will decrease all the various kinds of crisis in this in this world. It's not very difficult to observe that in this world full of science, technology, and material progress, people are really infatuated with the attractiveness, the deliciousness of of these things produced in this modern technological world. People are so hooked on the attractiveness of these things that they become envious of each other, they compete, struggle and fight. People are struggling for power in order to con- control the as much as they can, even trying to control the entire world. And so this brings up all kinds of conflict and fills the world with crises all over the place. Atamayata can can cut through that, will eliminate that being infatuated by getting caught up in all those attractive things and will thereby cut through a lot of the crises in the world. All this wonderful knowledge about atoms and subatomic particles and outer space and the cosmos and all these things all this increasing knowledge 
just leads to more jealousy and more competition. People take this knowledge and just try to use it to control the world more and more. So all this kind of knowledge is just leading to more competition and strife. A Dhammayada can, can free us from the attractiveness of that knowledge and allow us to live in peace. All the problems, all the problems that exist, whether physical, mental, or spiritual, all of these will be eliminated from the world through the power of a Tamayata. Whether you're going to live as a householder, a lay person, or a homeless one, you, you need to use a Dhammayata either way. Finally, we'd like to, to summarize saying that all of you who are searching for the best thing in life, all of you who are looking for the best thing for a human being, for a human life, searching without really knowing what you're looking for, but somehow trying to find the best thing, suit of what's most worthy and best and highest for human life. Would like to tell you that that best thing is atamayata, the thing that one is searching for. If one's really looking for what is best and highest, that thing is atamayata. This is the object of any genuine search. Or if you're, if you're looking for yourself, if you really find yourself, then you'll find that you've got problems. And you've got problems because you don't have a Dhammayada. And then you better find some a Dhammayada, better have a Dhammayada. And when one has a Dhammayada, then there are no more problems. So it's, it's a good thing to look what, for oneself. But once you find yourself, don't stop there. When you find out you don't have a Dhammayata and realize that you need it, then find it and have it. And then you'll be free of all problems. Life won't have any more problems. You've, you've heard the words probably, the, the world of the Messiah, the world when the Messiah has come and is then ruling the world correctly. In Buddhism, and many people are waiting for the coming of the Messiah, they're hoping for the Messiah's world. You can find the same kind of thing in Buddhism. Many Buddhists are waiting for the coming of the Maitreya Buddha. They talk about Si Ariya Maitreya coming and then there will be a world of universal love and peace and kindness. This idea appears in Buddhism, in Hinduism, in Christianity. You ought to know that when a Tamayata comes, then there is the Messiah. When a Tamayata is ruling the world, then we will have the world of the Messiah, the world of Maitreya Buddha, of universal peace and love and harmony. In Hindu, it's called Gauki. In Bud Buddhism, Maitreya. And in Christianity, Messiah. When, when Atamayata is controlling the world, when the world is under the influence of Atamayata, then there are no defilements. When there aren't any defilements, then there is peace. And so Dhamma is running the world through Atamayata. Atamayata is like a spaceship which lifts us out of hell and takes us up to heaven. And then Atamayata this, is this spaceship which lifts us out of heaven and takes us beyond all worlds takes us beyond the, the universe, beyond any, any condition, to where there's complete, 
complete freedom. A Dhammayata is a spaceship like this. In the political field, with a Dhammayata, there won't be capitalists and there won't be communists. There will just be what we call Dhammic socialism. Everybody loves each other and works together for the common good, for the good of society. And so society is run through Dhamma rather than these conflicting political ideologies. There's neither, there are not these opposite ideologies anymore. A Dhammayata has cut through them. And then everyone is just working together with kindness and love for the good of all. This is what we call Dhammic socialism. Everyone in the, in the universe are our friends in birth, aging, illness, and death. All of us share these fundamental experiences of birth, aging, illness, and death. So, in fact, we're all one. We're all one, one friend. And so where are you going to find an enemy or an opposite? In the Al-Quran of Islam, it says that all human beings in the universe are just one human being. That can't happen without, that can't happen without a Dhammayata. If there is a Dhammayata, then all human beings are one immediately. We need, we very desperately need to create understanding among all religions. This is a very important objective. So we need to use a Dhammayata to eliminate all the conflict and opposition so that all, all religions can help to get, work together to truly help humanity. We need a Dhammayata to, to eliminate any of the conflicts and the oppositions between human beings and celestial beings, or between the poor and the rich, and whatever. A Dhammayata is necessary to cut through any opposition, any conflict, any competition. We can compare a Dhammayata to an ambrosia, an, an eternal elixir, that if we drink this elixir of a Dhammayata, then we will never die. So the Christians have this word, the Hindus have this word, and the Buddhists have this word. The Amarita water, the water of deathlessness, or the ambrosia, the elixir of life, of eternal. So we, we ask all of you, we implore all of you to study a Dhammayata the best you can and practice a Dhammayata completely and fully and so that you have a Dhammayata and there are, there are no more problems, no more dukkha in, in this life. <clears throat> so allow us to end this, these lectures on a Dhammayata and once again we'd like to thank you for being very good and patient listeners.